Okay. We haven't started yet. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm just saying hello. We're getting uh, hooked up to the rest of the world now through Zoom and Facebook Live and YouTube. Uh, we welcome those that are here live and in person. I appreciate your efforts of coming out. I'm ready. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So the, the next lecture kept on switching its dates. Uh, so it's settled now. You see the date in front of you. It's March 2nd at 7.30. Uh, will be the last part of this three-part series that began earlier in the year. The topic for our next lecture is Calling All Heroes. Again, that will be Thursday night, March 2nd. So there was this fellow, Abe Cohn, and he went to a custom tailor shop to be fitted for a fine pair of pants. Comes back a week later, pants aren't ready. Comes back two weeks later, pants aren't ready. Three weeks later, still not ready. Six weeks, finally, his pants are ready. Six weeks, he tries them on and it fits perfectly. And nevertheless, when he comes to pay, he can't hold himself back and he has to just give a little bit of a jab to the tailor and he says, you know, it took God only six days to create the entire world. It took you six weeks to take care of my pants. Taylor says, yeah, but look at the pants and look at the world. <laughs> the world. The world appears to be pretty messed up. There's a famous expression, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And the statement is very profound and has a lot of truth to it. And like much of real wisdom, the same ideas can be found by the sages of the Mishnah and the sages of the Talmud. The perfect is the enemy of the good. What does that mean? It means that there are many situations in people's lives wherein they strive for perfection. But if they see they can't get there, and they can't reach that perfection, and it's not achievable, then they don't bother to at least make the attempt to try to make things a little better. So trying to be perfect becomes the enemy of the good. Because we're not going to strive for good if we can't get to perfection. There are people that won't begin a project or any endeavor if they don't think they can finish it. Nor will they even attempt things if they don't think they have the resources or the capacity to do it as well as they feel it should be done. And what happens as a result? Nothing gets done. In other words, the standards of, perf of perfection prevents people from making any changes at all. The perfect becomes the enemy of the good. And this is Talmudic wisdom. There's a statement in Ethics of Our Fathers, and it says, Loi alecha hamlocha ligmar. It's not your job to necessarily finish the task. But the Mishnah says, but that doesn't mean you're free from trying. You need to put in your effort. Maybe you're right. Maybe you won't be able to finish the project. Maybe you won't be able to do it as well as you think you should, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't start. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Here's the thing, the, the, world, the world by its very nature is imperfect. People by their very nature are not perfect. And therefore, to expect that you'll achieve perfection in this world, in any endeavor, is not realistic. We're not going to get to what we consider perfect. As it says in the book of Psalms, the heavens belong to God, but the earth he gave to man. The realm of the heavens is the realm of perfection. God can be perfect. But this earth, 
and those of us that live on this earth, the world that he gave to human beings, we are by, by definition not perfect. And this misguided expectation of perfection can affect so many areas of our lives, from the most mundane to the most important decisions a person may make in his life. I have an older brother. His name is Shalom Bear. When he was of marriageable age, he was introduced to many fine young ladies as potential what we call shidduchim, matches, prospects for marriage. And in some instances, it was clear to him that it wasn't a fitting match. But at other times, he saw a lot of good in that person. But he was troubled by one issue or another, and he was conflicted. So when he was faced with such dilemmas, he would write a letter to the Lubavitcher Rebbe for advice. Now generally, when a person was undecided on such matters, the Rebbe would not opine whether to marry or not to marry the person, but he would simply try to bring some clarity to the situation. And this went on for quite a few years, to the point that my brother was slowly becoming one of the oldest eligible bachelors in the community. One year on his birthday, he went in for a private audience with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And as customary in these audiences, it begins by presenting the Rebbe with a note, a letter of what's on your mind, and then the Rebbe would read it, and that's what the discussion points would be. So sure enough, one of the items on his note was his latest dilemma on the dating scene. The Rebbe reads the note, looks up at him, and he says this in Yiddish. You know what that means? It means it's been many years now that you've been writing to me on these issues. A mensch, a person, is nicht a computer. A person is not a computer. A mensch can design perfect. A person can't be perfect. Und du allein, and you yourself, is nicht perfect. You're not so perfect yourself. After this awkward pause, during which my brother swallowed hard, the Rebbe smiled with a wink. And he said, of course, in Chabad, we don't admonish. We don't chastise people. We try to uplift. We try to encourage. And the Rebbe wanted to make sure that he didn't come on too strong. Well, whether the Rebbe did come on too strong or didn't come on too strong, suffice it to say that shortly thereafter, my brother met and married the most wonderful woman, my dear sister-in-law, Sarah, with whom he's been happily married for 48 years with many amazing children and grandchildren. You may know their son from Thousand Oaks, Rabbi Chaim Brisky, Shalom Bers, and Sarah's son. But the Rebbe's message of don't seek perfection in others, because guess what? We're not perfect ourselves. We're human beings, and we're flawed, and we're imperfect. Now, sorry, there was this recently divorced woman, middle-aged woman. She moves back to her hometown, hoping to start up all over again. A few weeks later, she books a dentist appointment. And she's surprised because she recognizes the dentist's name as the same of this nice-looking, wholesome boy who had attended her high school 25 years earlier. However, when she walks into the dentist's office and she sees him, she quickly realizes this is not the guy because this doctor had this uh, a little bit of a belly. He was bald. The little bit of hair that he did have was gray. He looked much older than, than she did. No way is this the dashing kid from her days in high school. But nevertheless, as she was leaving, she says, by the way, did you go to Southridge High School? And he says, yeah, I graduated in 1987. She says, oh my gosh, you were in my class. To which he says, really, that's interesting. What class did you teach? <laughs> you see, being blind as we are to our own flaws and imperfections, we may see that the other aged, do we recognize that 
we are aging ourselves. I suggest that this problem has been exasperated by the expectations cultivated by the lifestyle of our current society. You see, today, we can get absolute perfection in our cars. They make cars with just about every bell and whistle imaginable. You can get cars that talk to you these days, that respond to you that move the seat exactly, knows exactly where you want the seat, to warm the seat to the temperature exactly as you like it. You can even get cars today to do the driving for you. They can even parallel park for you. So today you can get perfection when it comes to an automobile. You can get perfection in a cell phone. Every feature you can possibly want in this little gadget you can order a pie of pizza delivered to your home at the same time ordering a washing machine while getting directions how to drive from here to Cleveland while buying stocks or selling stocks all by pushing a few little buttons on your phone. In a matter of a few seconds, you can accomplish it all. And if you get tired of your iPhone 13, you can just simply upgrade and get the iPhone 14. And it's just going to continue perfection. We get perfection today from our coffee, right? You go into a Starbucks and you stand there and you say you would like a chai, latte, cappuccino, a shot of espresso, a spritz of that syrup, a half a spritz of that syrup. I want two millimeters of foam on the top. I want to make sure you got that little swirly heart floating around at the top and it has to be heated to exactly 214 degrees Fahrenheit. And you would think the person behind the counter would say, you nuts? Instead, she smiles and she says, no problem, sure. And she gets it to you exactly the way you want it. So if your coffee can be perfect and your car can be perfect and your phone can be perfect, you start having expectations that your spouse can be perfect, that your friends can be perfect, that your children can be perfect. And as much as we would like those around us, our friends and our family and our children to be perfect, they can't be perfect because they're human. And we shouldn't expect perfection from them. So whether it's in our relationships or at our jobs or our personal aspirations or even our spiritual aspirations, we need to get away from the Starbucks and iPhone mentality of expecting perfection. The Medrash tells us a story about two different people. One person enters a study hall, and he's excited about what he sees. They're studying. They're involved in the study of the Talmud, the back and the forth. So many legal questions. And he says, I would love to be part of this. So the schoolmaster says, can you read the Hebrew letters? He says, no, I've never studied the Hebrew letters. So he says, well, you got to start somewhere. The first thing you got to do is be able to put the letters together. You have to understand the meaning. Why don't you study with the, start with the five books of Moses, and you'll walk, work your way from there. You'll study the Mishnah. Then you'll get to the Talmud. And the fellow says, I don't got time for all of that. And he leaves. Second student comes in, the same thing, all excited about the level of study. He asks the same question. He's told the same answer. And he says, OK, so where do I start? got to start somewhere. Everyone has to start somewhere. The wise person, in order to get wise, you need to find a way to start. And today, in, in the study of Judaism, in the study of Torah, there is so much available for you. Just the advancement, just in the last 10 years alone, there is no subject that you may decide that you want to study that you can't get online. Every lecture on every subject is available to you. You can go on YouTube channel, you can go on this channel, on this channel. Everything is available to you. You can study wherever you live on the face of the planet. At any time that you want, think about it. It wasn't always this way. In order to study, you needed to live near an academy, near a place of learning, find out their schedule, hope that it worked with your schedule. Find a babysitter, perhaps. There were a lot of obstacles. You don't have those obstacles today. There is not a single subject under the moon in Judaism that you would like to study that you can't study at any time of the day or night, at any location in the world. So we need to start. 
don't expect to get to the end immediately. It takes time to study. Pick a subject. Pick something that interests you and start. Don't try to be perfect. Just try to strive along. On New Year's, the year 2020, there was this incredible event that took place at MetLife Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey. 90,000 Jews came together, not to celebrate New Year's. They came together for the 13th Siyum Hashas. What is that? A celebration of the completion of the study of the entire Talmud through a program called Daf Hayomi. For those that may not be familiar with Daf Hayomi, it's a program that was started in 1923. Someone calculated the 2,711 pages of the Talmud. And he divided it by saying, what if you studied one page a day? You would finish the entire Talmud in seven and a half years. Seven and a half years, one page a day. And at first, a few people took it on. The next cycle, a few more. The next cycle. Until now, where there's literally throughout the world hundreds of thousands of Jews studying this same page every single day. So when it came to the completion in 2020, they needed a large enough place to hold it. And they dreamed big. And they went to MetLife Stadium, which holds 90,000 people. And it was filled to capacity. And there was a tremendous celebration. Great rabbis spoke, and they sang together, and they danced together. Let's move one day forward. It's January 2nd, 2020. This Jewish educator, his name is Rabbi Binyamin Ginsburg. He's driving from his home in New Jersey. He's late to be giving a class in Brooklyn, New York. He left a little bit late. He's trying to make up some time on the Garden State Parkway. While weaving in and out of traffic, he suddenly sees the lights go on behind him. He was being pulled over for either driving a little too fast or perhaps not so safe by going from lane to lane. Pulls over on the side. The officer approaches Rabbi Ginsburg as he rolls down the window. Policeman looks into the car, steers into the car, and he says to him, tell me, did you study your page today? Rabbi Ginsburg at first did not understand what he was talking about. He said, what are you talking about? He said, I was on shift yesterday at MetLife Stadium. And you people were celebrating the studying of the page. I was listening to the speeches. It was all about studying the page a day. So did you study your page today? So he said, I actually didn't study it yet. But I'm heading to a class in Brooklyn. And then afterwards, I'm going to study my page. So the officer says, if you promise me that you'll do your page today, I'll let you off. And he sees the stunned expression on Rabbi Grinsberg's face, and he says, I want you to know that yesterday, one of my fellow officers was so moved by what took place at MetLife Stadium that he told me he wished he was Jewish. I said, why? He said, can you imagine this? People study a page of texts that are thousands of years old, and they're so excited about it. We've been on call at so many parties, and they usually turn wild, and the drinking begins, and it becomes quite unlawful. We have to break up fights. Even when a team wins a championship, they still burn down their city. And here, 90,000 people, and they're all celebrating, and they're excited. No one's drinking. All they're doing is excited about the study. They're excited about ancient texts. There's something so beautiful about that. And he said, you know, this place used to be called Giants Stadium, football team Giants. Today, this was a stadium of Giants. This is indeed what we, when we immerse ourselves in God's Torah. And, and we see it here when, when people of all backgrounds, of all ages, come together to study. Some people start studying when they're in their 30s, some in their 40s, some in their 50s, some in their 60s, some in the 80s. 
We have students that come here in 90 years old and they're coming to start studying because it's never too late. We're not striving to get to a perfection level. We're just studying for the sake of studying. Whatever we can do, we do. A wise man once put it this way, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start in order to be great. A few years ago, there was a man by the name of Noam Wasserman. Noam Wasserman was a professor at Harvard Business School. He wrote a book called Life is a Startup. And he writes that there are various handcuffs that we have in life. And he gives an example. He says, at times we shackle ourselves, we handcuff ourselves, and we keep ourselves stuck in these mediocre situations. And we have a hard time getting out of it. And the example he gave of his own life was he was invited to become the founder of an institution at USC. Prestigious university, prestigious job offer, but he had a hard time accepting it. And if he was being honest with himself, with, which he strives to be in this book, he says it really came down to one reason he was having a hard time accepting this job. His email address. Mm -hmm. You see, at Harvard, his email address was noam at hbs.edu. HBS stands for Harvard Business School. And you have that H in your email address that represents Harvard, you're a somebody. Just that H in your email address means you're a somebody. If he was to take the job at USC, his email address would be noam at usc.edu. Now, USC is nice, but it's not Harvard. And he struggled with this. Should he take this job or not? Over an email address. And one day he decides he's going to do it. And he takes the job. And he writes, think about it. Rather than being one of 200 professors at Harvard, I am the founder now of my own institution. Today, Noam Wasserman is the widely respected dean of the Cy Sims Business School. If it wasn't for that bold move years earlier, he would still just be one of many professors instead of the dean of an entire school. Now, as much as we laugh at this, do we not do that to ourselves? Do we not handcuff ourselves at times and not allowing us to move forward? The handcuffs of what we call the handcuffs of complacency or the fear of the unknown, it keeps us stuck. We don't like taking risks. We want our lives to be safe and tidy and sheltered. No rocking the boat or shaking things up. I understand it's, it's a sound approach. But then staying frozen in place is not that good either. And at some point we look at our lives and we realize nothing ventured, nothing gained. As President Kennedy put it, there are risks and costs to action but they are far less than the long-range risks of comfortable inaction. In fact, sometimes these handcuffs of complacency, the fear of the unknown, can be rather catastrophic. Several years before my father passed away, we got him to tell his life story. He allowed himself to be interviewed about his life. Up until then, he never spoke about the years of the war. He never spoke about the Holocaust never spoke much about his family, who he lost every single member of. Too painful to open up. Too hard to talk about it. On one of the occasions that he was here for one of my son's bar mitzvahs, we encouraged him in a private room to allow a videographer and an interviewer to speak to him and to ask questions. We only got to see this interview after he passed away. And to realize what he carried with him all of his life and the pain of what it was like to lose an entire family and to run as being a teenager to try to run for your life and fend for yourself out there. But on the tape, he relates that after months of trying to escape the Nazis from one end of Poland to the other following the outbreak of the war, he and many of his friends were reunited in Vilna, Lithuania. And while there, they set up a new yeshiva just amongst themselves. 
a bunch of literally orphan children. They set up a yeshiva as the war and the Nazi advance raged on. Now, during this early time of the war, they were still able to receive and send messages to the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, to Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, who continued to guide them on both physical and spiritual matters. He was in New York at the time, the previous Rebbe. They were still stuck in Poland, but there was the ability to communicate. At one point, the previous Rebbe conveyed to them that if there would come a time when the communication would be cut off, which obviously took place, that they needed answers to critical questions, they should go to the Amshin of a Rebbe, a different Hasidic Rebbe that was with them in Lithuania. His name was Rabbi Shimon Sholem Kalish. And the previous Rebbe and the Amshin of a Rebbe had this close relationship. And the previous Rebbe told his Hasidim, if you have questions and you can't get through to me, you can't get a note to me, a telegram to me, or I can't respond to you, you can go to him and trust him that whatever he advises you to do is what I want you to do. While in Vilna, while in Lithuania, the reports of Nazi brutality were getting more and more ominous. And one day it came to light that there was a diplomat, an angel of a man named Chiun Sugihara. He was in charge of the Japanese consulate in Lithuania. And he was willing to give visas to Jews to escape to Japan. They would hopefully then receive a visa from the American consulate in Japan and be able to go on to the United States. By the way, that part ended up taking five years in itself to get America to let them in. But there was a big debate that broke out amongst the various Jews in Vilna. Some said, let's take these visas and get ourselves on a train across all of Russia and over to Japan. And others said, no, we're fine here. The war hasn't reached Lithuania. We're OK here. We're sitting and studying the Talmud here. Why should we walk away from our learning and get on a train for days and days and weeks and weeks and boats and stuff? Let's just stay. Critical question. No communication with New York anymore. What to do? They were given instructions. If in doubt, go to the Amshin of Arab. They went to the Amshin of Arab in Vilna and they told him, this is the situation. Shion Sugihara is willing to give us visas. And he immediately said, this is a matter of life and death and we must take these visas now and go. And let out word to all the yeshiva students that were there, take the visa and go. A few thousand took those visas and lived. And when my father tells the story on this video, you see tears welling up in his eyes. And he says others didn't follow the advice. And they didn't take the visas. And they stayed. And soon thereafter, they ascended to heaven. They didn't survive. There are times when in action, when standing back and doing nothing, can be quite catastrophic in our lives. There are times that we have to see the opening and we have to see the avenue and we have to make a move. Then there are the handcuffs of fear and the handcuffs of failure. We think if I start this, maybe it's gonna fail. I don't wanna to have to swallow the bitter pill of failure, so best not to try. Even though you never know where things will go if you try. You know that Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, was once asked how it felt to fail a thousand times before he invented a successful light bulb. To which he said, I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps. That's why it succeeded. I know the focus this week is on LeBron James catching up to the record of points 
from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It's going on this week. He's going to soon pass the record and have more points than any other basketball player that ever lived. And so all this debate of who is the GOAT uh, of basketball, the greatest of all times, is going on right now. But for us, from the earlier days, we all thought, and still think some of us, the Michael Jordan of the Chicago Bulls is the GOAT of basketball, the greatest of all times. So I would allow me to share a quote tonight from Rabbi Michael Jordan. He said this, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. 26 times I was entrusted to make the winning shot, and I missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that's why I succeeded. Because I got back up again. Because the fear of failure didn't deter me. If you're playing in the game and there's one second to go and they give you the ball and you shoot it and you miss, you're walking home knowing you let that team down. It was all in your hands. It was all in that one shot. and You didn't score. What happens the next game? Well, there's a timeout with one second to go. So some will say to the coach, give someone else a turn. You don't want to carry that on your shoulders. But the great ones say, give me the ball. And even if they miss that night again, they're going to try the next one and the next. That's what makes us great. If we don't give up, perfect, no one's going to be perfect. Get it in every time? No one's going to get it in every time. In baseball, if you bat 300 for your entire career, you're going to the Hall of Fame. 300 is, uh, you're about one for three. What's one for three is a 333 batting average. That means that a majority of times, two out of three times, you're getting out. It's not about perfection. It's about giving it your all. And the same is true of all great achievers throughout history. Did you know that Abraham Lincoln lost eight elections before he won the presidency? Had he given up after two, after three, after four, there would not have been an Abraham Lincoln in this country, and who knows how different this country would look. The author J.K. Rowling was destitute before she published her first Harry Potter book. You know how many variations Elon Musk came up of his electric car that failed, that didn't work, until finally Tesla's out there. If you just are afraid of failure, nothing is going to happen. And of course, we as Jews, we don't need celebrities or athletes or entrepreneurs or presidents to teach us this lesson. King Solomon said it. He said, the righteous person falls down seven times and gets right back up. The meaning of that statement is not despite the fact that the righteous person falls down, he gets up. No, it's because he falls down that he achieves greatness because he then gets back up. The very process of failing and rebounding is the path to success and to righteousness. So we have to tell this to ourselves and we have to tell this to our children. Yes, there are challenges in life, there are defeats in life, there are setbacks in life, there are disappointments in life, there are moral and spiritual failings in life because we are imperfect human beings. But the trick is to bounce back and hit it again and again. The point is don't allow yourself to be dragged down by yesterday's failures. Don't be frozen in space, in your place, because it didn't work the day before. Get up and do what you can do today, even if it's less than perfect. One author put it this way. The imperfect book that gets published is better than the perfect book that never leaves your computer. Or a 20-minute walk that I do is better than the four-mile run that I don't do. You know, you keep thinking, I see these joggers, and they could do nine miles, 10 miles, 26 miles. And I wish I can get there. I can't run a block. Oh, I, I can't do it because I can't run 26 miles. Well, maybe just start with a 20-minute walk. Because at least that you can accomplish. You can't do 20, do 10. You want to keep dreaming for the 26 mile, chances are you're not going to get there. Or as we've heard others say, a half a loaf of bread is better than no loaf at all. 
Now, we're familiar with the story of Joseph, one of the famous stories in all of the Bible. And you remember some of the details of that story. He was brought down to Egypt. He worked in the house of someone named Potiphar. Now, if you remember the story, Potiphar's wife has her eye on Joseph. The Torah tells us he's a good-looking guy. He's a handsome guy. And she wanted to seduce him. So she tries every womanly while to try to get Joseph to succumb to her advances. The Medrash relates that Joseph would say, I can't do this. I, I can't do this. And she would come the next day and she would try again. And she would wear different clothing each day. And she would try different perfumes each day. And each day try to get him in some type of way to seduce him. This went on one day, one week, a month, a number of months. It keeps going on. And one day the wife of Potiphar comes to Joseph and she says, listen to here, listen to me, Joseph. You know, and I know, that you're going to break. No human being can stand up to this. You're a single guy here, and you must be hungry for this as well. And I'm pretty myself, and you want me. I know you want me. So give in already. Just stop. Stop postponing the inevitable. It's going to happen. So let's do it now. Joseph says, Mrs. Potiphar, you're right. I probably can't hold on too much longer. But I'm going to hold on for one more day. Just one more day. And tomorrow I'm going to try to hold on to one more day. And each day, my challenge is, can I hold on just one more day to resist the temptation, not to give in to you? If I think long term, I'm like you. There's no way I can do this permanently. But can I survive one more day saying no to you? That I can do. And indeed, he doesn't succumb. He remains righteous all of his years in Egypt. And that's why Joseph in Jewish history goes down as Yosef HaTzadik. Yosef, the righteous one, because his philosophy in life was, I'm going to try my best. Perfection, I don't think I'll reach perfection. Caving in, at some point I will. But the challenge for me is today. Can I do this today? That's why he's called the righteous one. These are the lessons for us to internalize in our imperfect lives. Let's do what we can to strengthen our relationships, to learn, to grow, to become more spiritual, more Jewishly involved. Early on in our forefathers, Abraham's career as the first Jew to walk the face of the earth, God says something very, very curious to him. God says to Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. Be perfect. I just spent the whole time talking to you about we're not meant to be perfect. And here God comes to Abraham, walk before me and be perfect. The answer is, the operator phrase in that statement is, walk before me. Your job is to walk the walk. Take those steps. And by virtue of walking, of taking whatever steps you can, you will be perfect. Perfect in my eyes. I will see you as perfect. You don't have to be perfect for me to see you as perfect. What you have to do is try. That's what I'm looking for. Walk the walk. Walk before me. You do the best you can. That's perfection for me, says God Almighty. You see, Judaism is about the process, not necessarily the product. It's about your effort, not necessarily your success. It's about your journey, not necessarily the destination. To be a Jew means Yisrael, one who wrestles and struggles with God. Aspiring and striving is what's authentic. Authentic spirituality is about striving, trying, putting in the effort. Not incumbent upon you to finish the job, but that doesn't free you from starting it. And it is this philosophy of not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, of doing the best you can today, 
of always getting back and continuing the walk that enables us to rise to the heights of our potential and achieve real greatness. I'm going to conclude with one last story. Several years ago, there was a young man by the name of Dovi Mandelbaum. He's walking in Jerusalem. He's heading to an apartment where there resides a rabbi. His name was Erez Mishikovsky. Erez Mishikovsky was the headmaster of a school that Dovi had attended many years before. Why was Dovi going to see his old headmaster? Well, there is a tradition in Israel and perhaps in other places that when you're about to get married, instead of mailing an invitation to the individual that inspired you most in your life, you hand deliver it. Dovi was engaged to get married. And in his mind, Rabbi Mishikowski really helped change his life and put him in the direction that he went. And therefore, he's bringing this rabbi, who he hadn't seen in years, an invitation to his wedding. He knocks on the door. Rabbi Mishikowski opens the door, immediately recognizes his student of years ago. And he says, to what do I owe the great honor of your visit, Dovi? And Dovi says, I'm getting married. And I came to deliver an invitation because you have had such an impact in my life. Mishikowski is very nice to see him. In fact, he was one of his earlier students of his early years of his school. Nice to see how he has grown up. Now, although it was years ago that he attended Mishikowski's school, he always remembered him. After he went to this particular school, he ended up meeting up with different schools of Chabad. He became a Chabad student. He, in fact, was engaged to someone from a Chabad family. Rabbi Mishikovsky's school was not a Chabad school, but still, he felt that Rabbi Mishikovsky set him straight on the path that he needed to go. Rabbi Mishikovsky opens the invitation, takes a look at it, looks it over, and says, wow, nice, very nice. I plan on being at the wedding. It'll be my honor to be at the wedding. He says, uh, I see the girl that you're marrying, the family, I see. She's from Chabad. And he says, uh, yeah. And you, Dovi, you became Chabad too? Yeah, yeah, very nice, very nice. Tell me something. Do you know if your future mother-in-law ever visited the Lubavitch Rebbe when he gave out dollars on a Sunday? Back to the background of this is, for many years, the Lubavitch Rebbe on Sunday would stand outside his office, and anyone in the world that wanted to come see him would be able to line up, line stretch for blocks for hours, but you would have an opportunity to see the leading holy rabbi of our generation, to ask for a blessing that you needed for something in life. And in that encounter, the Rebbe would also give you a crisp dollar bill. And he would ask you to take that dollar bill and do something good with it. Give it to charity. Give it to another person. So that when there's an encounter of two individuals, a third person benefits from it. That was the way the Rebbe thought. And so it was called, did you go to the Rebbe for dollars? And you would get a dollar. Now, because you got a dollar in your hand from such a holy figure, you'd want to keep it. But the Rebbe said you should give a dollar to another person. So what did you do? What was the trick? You exchanged it. You kept the dollar that the Rebbe gave you, and you gave from your own wallet. Usually you increased it. You gave a $5 bill, a $10 bill to a poor person, the next person that you saw. But this way you would collect dollar bills that the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself handed you with a blessing. And people looked at that with tremendous value. So here's Rabbi Mishikowski asking this boy that's getting married if his future mother-in-law ever got a dollar bill from the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And if so, do you know when? And he says, no, I never actually asked her this question. But you know what? The next time I see her, I'll ask her the question. I'll come back and I'll give you the answer. Very well, very well. The next time Dovi was by his bride's house for Shabbat, he asks his future mother, tell me, did you get a dollar from the Lubavitcher Rebbe? And he sa she says, of course I did, yes. And when did you get uh, the last time that you went? She said, I actually remember it well. It was the month of Shvat, 
uh, about February time, in the year 5751, which would be about February 1991, was when she remembered getting this dollar bill. Okay, Dovi has the information. He was given a homework task from his old teacher. He comes back to the apartment at some point later and he says, you asked me a question, the answer is yes. She did. Shvat 5751. The rabbi says, thank you very much for getting back to me. You know, I have a story to tell you that's worth a million dollars. A million dollars. But because I really like you, I'll tell it to you for $10,000. Though he says, I, I don't have $10,000. So he says, you know what, I'll make a deal. Aside for coming to your wedding, the week after the wedding, you have parties every night, Sheva Brachot. Invite me to one of those Sheva Brachot parties, and I'll tell that story then for free. But trust me, it's a good story. Okay, I'll get you an invitation. Anyway, Dovi gets married. The wedding was beautiful. Rabbi Mishikovsky was out the wedding, danced with his former student of many years. Beautiful wedding, and kept his word. A Shever Brochot party a few nights later, held an outdoor area, big barbecue. They set up a microphone, and the Chatan gets up and he says, my former teacher, Rabbi Mishikowski, dean of this and this school, has a story to tell. And he assures us that it's a million dollar story. Without further ado, Rabbi Mishikowski. Rabbi Mishikowski gets up to the microphone and he says this. So this is the story within the story. Around 25 years ago, when I got married, my wife, Hani, and I had an understanding. When we were dating, we discussed what type of lives we would want. And we both agreed of what we wanted in life. We wanted simplicity. She wanted and I wanted to be able to sit and study as much as possible. And so it was agreed upon that if we were to get married, I would learn what's called kolel. That's an advanced study hall for married people. My wife would take a teaching position that would help support us, and I would sit and study. It would be a simple life, not too expensive, simple apartment. That's what we wanted, simplicity. Living in Israel, studying Torah, what could be better spiritually? So there I was, we got married, I'm studying in a kolil in the city of Netanya. The kolil that I was studying at was connected to a post high school yeshiva program for young men. So they shared the same campus. Everything was going according to plan. Life was blissful, life was perfect. But then as I was studying, I saw something going terribly wrong with some of the younger students in the adjacent school. Many of them were becoming disaffected. Some were luring away from the yeshiva environment. They were getting involved in all sorts of inappropriate activities. And the administration of that particular school was beside themselves what to do with these kids. And the only course of action that they could come up with was to throw these kids out of school. You don't want to be here? Don't be here. Leave. They wanted to preserve the integrity of the students that wanted to study. It's a great debate amongst educators. What's your role? What's your job? But to me, the glaring question was, so if you kick these kids out, what's going to happen to them? Are you thinking about their souls? Are you thinking about their lives? Are you thinking about their families? Each one of them is a precious soul. And you hear you're giving up on them by just kicking them out. So although, again, I'm in a different school, I'm in a, an advanced school for married people, we're just sharing a campus, I mixed in. I went to the principal's office. I said, I see you're kicking kids out left and right. Aren't you concerned about what's going to happen to them? And at first, I got the look of, who do you think you are telling us what to do? You're not a member of the staff of this school. I said, no, I'm not a member of the staff. I'm just a concerned fellow Jew, and uh, there's got to be a better way. He said, we've tried everything with them. We've tried enticing them. We've tried inspiring them. We've tried uh, 
bribing them. We've done everything. We, we're done. We're done. We can't do it anymore. So I don't know what got into me, he says. He's telling the story at the same party after the wedding, you remember? And he says, I decided to rent a little house. And I'll have these kids stay at this house. And for a few hours a day, I'll tear myself away from my own studies, and I'll teach them myself. And then maybe I'll find someone in the community that could mentor them in some type of job, perhaps. So they'll be doing some studying and some job training. So I started doing that on the side. Then I needed to pay rent. That's a problem, because I didn't have the money. So I started raising some money from some of the other families in the community. And then we picked up a few more, more students. And then it involved more of my time, and more fundraising, and more programming, and more teaching. Truth is, he said, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I was just a simple guy, supposed to mind my own business, but I couldn't. And I just found myself torn in two worlds, focusing on the life that Hani and I planned out, and my guilt of seeing these Jewish kids perhaps going to be lost to our people. And at some point, I realized that my own learning and my own personal life has been thrown into disarray. Because the time that it was taking me to do this was starting to become full time. And as overwhelmed as I was for my dear wife, she felt, and rightfully so, I was in over my head, stressed out about having to raise the funds and keep the program going. And this is not what we agreed to. We mapped out our lives. We planned it out. We were going all to plan. What happened here? It, don't get me wrong, he's telling everyone. She understood how important the work I was doing was, but, but why you? We, we had a deal. Everything we planned is gone. And it was causing tremendous inner turmoil and a rift in our marriage. And one day I realized that it can't go on like this. I have to resolve one way or another how I'm going to proceed in my life. Either we're going to be together, my wife and I, and say this is what we're doing, or I'm going to have to leave it all, hope someone else fills my shoes, and go back to the quiet life of sitting and learning, studying myself. But I can't do both. It's not going to work. So I said to my wife, honey, I'm going to take a day off tomorrow. You take a day off tomorrow. Let's just go out. We'll have a picnic somewhere. We're going to talk through life. And together, we will make a decision. We'll do it together. And whatever we decide, we both go in completely. If we decide I'm leaving this and going back to the study all day, then that's what we're doing. If we decide that I'm doing this, we're doing it together. But we can't go on like this anymore. Hani agreed. Next day, we both took off from work. We're going to have a picnic. We went to this park, sat down on the grass. It was right next to this natural pool of water. And the pool of water was being fed by a waterfall that was coming from a higher level in the park. So there's water coming down from a higher level, a waterfall into this beautiful stream that's near us. I'm facing the water. Hani has her back to the water. And I'm trying to think, OK, so what do we do now? This is a great idea that we have this picnic. But like, how do we begin this conversation? And where are we going with this? I can't find the right words to start the conversation. But suddenly, in the corner of my eye, I see something red tumbling down the falls. Was that a, a red bundle? Was it a, a red backpack that I just saw? Or were my eyes deceiving me? And I immediately leaped to my feet. I jumped into the water with all my clothes on. And the bundle's first bob to the surface was miraculously within my grasp, because it was a little girl. 
no more than a toddler. I grabbed her, and she was gasping and coughing and spitting out water, but thank God, very much alive. I staggered out of the water, gripping this bundle. I was very shaken. The child was terrified, of course. Hani saw this happen like, so quickly. I just ran and jumped and coming out with a toddler in my hand. She put the blanket around the baby, calmed the baby. And we realized that this whole thing happened so fast that the child's family must be playing on the top part of the park and never even realized that the toddler is missing. So we began the trek to the upper terrace of the park. Me in my sopping wet clothes, holding this red bundle. We get there and we immediately see that there's this large family spread out across a number of blankets, lots of kids eating and talking and laughing and enjoying themselves. And clearly, still at this point, no one had an inkling that this little girl dressed in red wasn't amongst her siblings and cousins. As I approached them, I didn't have to say a word. Everyone stared at me in horror, transfixed, unable to say anything. The child's mother sees the scene and becomes hysterical. She suddenly grasps the enormity of what just took place. And she began shrieking. As words started rushing from her mouth, she pulls the child from my arms, holds her, kisses her, and begins to cry. And she starts thanking God and thanking my wife and thanking me. How can I ever thank you? How can I ever thank you? She kept on repeating over and over, how can I ever thank you? And suddenly she calls for someone from her family to go to her car and to fetch her purse. And I immediately said, stop, I'm not taking money for this. Don't, don't, don't bring your purse here. And she reaches for her purse and she takes out a single American dollar bill from her wallet and she wants to hand it to me. Lest anyone think that her intended reward for my act of heroism was one single dollar, which is about four shekel, she quickly explained that this was no ordinary dollar bill. She was giving me the most precious thing she owned, a dollar bill given to her by the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself. And I repeated again that I didn't want any rewards for this. I simply did what anyone would do, what I was supposed to do, and she kept insisting that I take it. And finally, I said to her, listen, you're a Chabad family. To you, this dollar bill that was given to you by the Lubavitcher Rebbe is the most precious thing you have. I'm not a Chabadnik. I'm not even a Chassid. To me, the dollar is a dollar. It doesn't have that value. You should keep it. It doesn't make sense for you to give that away. The one that sees the value in it should be the one to hold on to it and to keep it. At that point, she gave me this look that only a Jewish mother knows how to give. And she said to me, you take this dollar. You take this dollar from the Rebbe. And I promise you that it will bring you clarity, it will bring you peace, and it will bring you blessings. And it will bring strength into your life. And with that, she just put that dollar in my hand. Remember Rabbi Mishakovsky is telling this story at the Shever Brachas party that he asked to be invited to? As he reaches this point, he reaches into his pocket and he pulls out this crisp dollar bill from his coat pocket and he shows it to the audience. And then he reads on the dollar bill that it says, from the holy Admor of Lubavitch, from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, dated Shavat 5751. Other than Shabbat, this dollar bill is with me all the time, he says to the audience. Now you may think 
that I was the savior of that little girl. But that's not the full story. You see, what brought my wife and me to the park that day was a last ditch attempt to find an answer to our dilemma. When that baby fell into that waterfall, it became clear, the answer was clear to us that my mission was to devote myself to saving lives. That was the answer. And the fact that the response to my action was to be given a dollar bill from the Lubavitcher Rebbe who devoted his entire life, his entire leadership to bringing Jewish souls back to their roots served to reinforce what my path must be. My calling was to save others, an unmistakable sign that tumbled from the heavens along with a dollar bill from Brooklyn was attesting to this. Here is your answer. And because of that life-altering moment, we packed our bags, we moved from Netanya, we moved to Jerusalem, and we opened up a yeshiva that year for boys who needed a different approach, who couldn't handle a full day in yeshiva, who needed a few hours of this and a few hours of that. And today's groom, Dovi, he was from our first students. As for today's bride, I must say that it was so nice to see you at your wedding wearing a white dress instead of the red one you were wearing the first time we met. Everyone at the party sat stunned in silence. The bride's mother wiped her tears and said, and Kavod Rav, honored rabbi, it's nice to see you in dry clothes rather than the soaking ones you were wearing the first time we met. Ladies and gentlemen, perfect lives, perfect lives is a myth. It doesn't exist. Not in this world. Perhaps when Mashiach comes, when the Messiah comes, God willing soon, we'll revisit the question of perfection. But until then, let's focus and truly meditate on this one simple statement of truth. Life doesn't have to be perfect to be wonderful. We each go out. We each do what we can. We strive to do the best we can, not for perfection, but within our abilities. And we will find that miracles will happen, miracles for others and miracles for ourselves. Thank you very much for joining me. I'll take any questions if anyone has, comments. Jokes? Very, very nice. Thank you. Right, next one again is March 2nd.